I made this animated scene in Blender in just one day by channeling the power of geometry nodes. Blender's geometry nodes are quickly replacing the traditional workflows of particles, modifiers and simulations. In fact, the Blender developers are determined to make everything node-based in future versions of Blender. So as a Blender artist, it's going to be more and more important for you to understand how node-based systems work. In this scene, aside from the human character, all of the objects you're seeing are scattered and animated using just geometry nodes. So if I select it, we can see that there are no keyframes here. It's all handled in the geometry nodes editor. These days, so many traditional modifiers are not only possible in geometry nodes, they offer a lot more customizability, allowing you to do things that you can't do by just using the modifier. Today's video will be an example of this. We'll explore multiple node systems and we will compare them to their modifier counterparts. Yes, in this video we're focusing on modifiers, but in the future Blender will have the simulation nodes, so definitely we will do particles and simulations as well. If you want to see that, consider clicking the subscribe button and you can also click the bell to get notified when that video drops. And while you're at it, why not leave a like on the video if you'd like to explore in what ways a node system can be better than a modifier. So with that out of the way, let's get into it. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More about them at the end of the video. The first example we're going to take a look at is the array modifier. Now an array is very simply made in geometry nodes. We just take a mesh line and instance our geometry nodes on it. That is to say we turn every vertex of that mesh line into a copy of our geometry. And as you can see it does work but it's not automatically aligned to uh, how big the object is. So we have to use this slider to specify how far away from each other uh, the copies are. But luckily that's also very easy to change. Because we can draw a bounding box around our geometry and based on that we can see how far the distance should be between each copy. So we're going to get a bounding box node and multiply the maximum um, on just the one axis by two. Now why do we multiply it by two? Well that's because the bounding box actually gives us basically this distance and we want to double that so it's the width of the entire cube. Now I can show this better by deleting the cube and actually creating a monkey. Um, because then you will see that the monkeys are instantly aligned. Uh, and we can also use the viewer node using the node wrangler add-on, which is a free add-on uh, you can install using just here in the preferences. Go over here, node wrangler, uh, and you turn it on right there. It's very useful for shortcuts in the node editors. Anyways, I'm going off topic. So let's go to our original node group. And we're gonna press Control, Shift, and click on this bounding box node. Because then we can see what the bounding box does, right? It takes our original geometry and draws a box around it. Uh, and then it checks for the maximum, uh, which is drawing a vector from over here to over here, basically multiplying by two. So it becomes this distance. Uh, and then it instances that on a mesh line, uh, which gives us the array. And we can control the amount of instances by just pulling on this count value. So make it, for instance, very large, to get a whole bunch of instances just like that. Now we can also play with this multiply node to give them a little more space or uh, to actually send them in another direction as well. That is all fine and good, but the array modifier can do all of this. So how do we make it better than the modifier? Now let's say I have a collection of objects of varying sizes and I want to put all of them on an array. Well, luckily we can do that. And as you can see, it maintains the correct distance between all of the objects. So let's build this node group. But before we do, we're going to check our collection because it's very important that the origin of every object is directly in the middle of its shape. So here you can see that the distance is uh, the same on this side as on this side, uh, which is default for all the primitives. They will always be in the middle. But yeah, keep that in mind when you're making this node group. And actually, let's pick out the collection of houses that I had, uh, which is this one. Um, yeah, that looks cool. So yeah, get your objects, uh, put them in a collection. Uh, this, this collection is another scene, so that's why you can't see it. So I'm going to get rid of those uh, and uh, do it with this one. First of all, we're going to start with an object. Can be any object because we're not using the input geometry. So let's get rid of it and add a mesh line. And the first thing I'm going to do is create a group input for the count. Uh, and all the group inputs can be accessed over here. So if I now start pulling on this, uh, you can see that the count increases and decreases. Next, let's get our collection. So collection info and let's select the houses collection over here. And we're going to separate and reset the children. 
And what we want to do now is instance all of those objects onto our mesh line, but then we want to move those objects based on every object's bounding box. Remember we did the trick with the bounding box, but the problem that we will face is that it outputs just a single vector. In contrast to something like the position node, uh, this outputs one vector for every element, so every vertex of your mesh line. But the bounding box only outputs one vector, even though we have a collection of objects. So how do we fix this issue? How do we essentially get a field of bounding boxes? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to count our instances. We're going to count how many objects there are in this collection. And we do that by using the domain size node. Uh, if we set it to instances, it will output a single integer value, which is the amount of objects in this collection. And we can use this to determine how many bounding boxes we'll need in the end. Now what I'm going to do is subtract one from this value, just so we can make a list that starts at zero. And then let's also add a random value node. Set it to integer and we're going to plug our value into the max. This is what we'll use later to pick random houses out of the collection and put them side by side. And then we have a seed so we can get different combinations of those houses. Oops. Now we're going to put this to the side for a second uh, and grab our geometry. Uh, and I want to basically make a separate group of that. So how I'm going to do that is just plug it into the output for a second. Make some cuts and put it like over here. Uh, and then I'm going to press uh, Ctrl G and this creates a new group, basically a group inside of a group. So if I press tab, I can go out of it. And here we have our new geometry nodes group. Now I learned this method from a channel called Loose Edges. Yes, he has a lot of very useful videos if you want to learn geometry nodes. So go check out his channel. He's very underrated. Subscribe to him. Let's go back into the node group because I want to create a new group input. Uh, we can do that by selecting the group input. Let's press the ends. So we get the menu over here, then go down to group. Uh, and we just add an input and this is going to be the index of our instances. So uh, let's set it to an integer as well. Uh, and let's connect our random value output from over here. So uh, the first thing we want to add is one of those bounding box nodes. Uh, and let's use the viewer node. So control shift click to see what that gets us. Basically, we get a lot of boxes, one box for every house in the collection. And the first thing we want to do is realize those instances. Uh, so we turn it from instances to actual geometry. So how do we proceed from here? Well, uh, let's think about these boxes. Because a box is, of course, always made out of eight vertices. And we can use this fact to our advantage. Let's start with an index node. This gives us an integer value for every vertex of the mesh. And what we're going to do is we have this instance index up here. I will just name it so we can distinguish it from the uh, original index because the original index will count every point and the instance index will count every box. And essentially what we want to do is from these boxes, uh, let's get a cube to visualize this. For every box, we want to draw a vector from down here to up here. And then we want to store this vector inside our instance index so that we end up with one corresponding vector for every instance. Let's first start with our vertex index and divide it by eight and then floor it. By doing this, we can see in the spreadsheet editor that we get one value for every eight vertices. So for every box, basically. So we can see the first eight values have zero because we're counting zero as well. Then the second eight have one then two, etc. Next, we're gonna take the same vertex index and instead of dividing it by eight, we're gonna do a modulo by eight. What this does is that it counts up to seven and then goes back to zero for every eight vertices. And we can see that in the viewer node because black is zero and we can see zero uh, repeated in this list over and over again. And in this case, zero will always be the, I guess, bottom left corner of our box. And that's exactly where our vector should start, right? We're going to want to draw uh, one from this corner and then to the corner up here. So let's do that by creating a compare node. Uh, we're going to get one equal to zero and then another one. And this one is going to be equal to seven because seven is the last place in the index. It's the eighth vertex seven will give us the correct corner of our box and if we look at the other result yeah we can see the other corner now to draw vectors between these two sets of points uh, we're going to use the position node 
So let's get it over here. Uh, let's get the position node. And first we're going to want to exclude all of the points but these two. Um, so let's do that by getting a vector math node and just setting it to scale. Uh, and then we're going to use these results to just scale it down to zero, uh, except for uh, the ones that come out as one. They will stay the same. One for this node and then another one uh, for the other node. Now, before we're going to subtract these from each other to create the vector, we first have to store both of them uh, into the instance index. Let's get an accumulate field node and set it to vector. And we're going to connect one of the vectors. And then for the group ID, we're going to use uh, the index that we've created over here. What this does is instead of having this list where zero has a vector and then we have seven vectors that are empty and then eight has a vector, it just stores the one at zero into all of the positions up to eight and then it stores that for the next eight positions and then the next one for the eight positions, etc. And that's because we've defined that selection earlier, right? Because we've made this with uh, zero for the first eight, one for the second eight, etc. It's using that to store all of those vectors into the remaining positions. So let's get another one for the other vector, plug it in like that. And now we're going to capture both of the resulting vectors. So let's pull this out for a little bit uh, and get a capture attribute node, connect it up here, set it to vector, and I'm going to connect that up. And we're going to do the same for the other one. Now remember how we connected this instance index to our group input? Uh, actually, <laughs> let's rename that so it's not that ugly that's better uh we're finally gonna use it so let's get it over here for a second because uh let's refresh our brains to see what it actually is yeah so it gives us basically random values up to the amount of houses that are in the collection so um i guess there are upwards of 20 something houses in there because the numbers because the numbers aren't getting much bigger than I guess 21 over here. And then the other two things we have, of course, are the vectors, which are ordered very differently because they are the same for the first eight positions and then the second eight, like we talked about, etc. But we really only want to map just this vector to one of these entries. So these eight vectors should be one vector stored in the zero position. And then the second eight should be one vector stored in this one position etc. And we can remedy this by just getting a simple math node and multiplying our index by 8. By multiplying it by 8 we can make sure that the correct vector in this list of vectors is mapped to the correct instance. And to actually store them we will need a sample index node. And let's connect it up. I'm going to set it to vector uh, and connect our first vector and then for the index input we want to just connect our output from over here. And then we want to do the exact same for the other attribute. So connect those up and connect the same value to the index input. And there we go. We actually already have some outputs for our bounding boxes. This output will give us the maximum. It's the maximum because it looks at every eighth vertex in our original bounding box. So yeah, this is the maximum. Maybe put that down here and put this up here. Might be better. Uh, and then this is the minimum. So let's name those accordingly. And then if we take this vector and get a subtract node uh, and subtract this vector from it, uh, we will get the size of the bounding box. So make sure they're connected up correctly like that. So not like this, but this one goes down here so that this gets subtracted from this. And let's connect this vector to the output as well. This is going to be the size of our bounding box. So that is our finished node group. If we go out of it, uh, we basically have something akin to the original bounding box node. But instead of outputting just one bounding box, it outputs all the bounding boxes. So let's finally use those bounding boxes to move our objects on this mesh line. Because we actually haven't instanced anything yet. So let's do that right now. Let's move it over and get an instance on points node. And we connect our mesh line to the points and our collection to the instances. And we're going to check pick instance. If we connect this up, we will see that all of the houses are smashed together. I mean, I can change the mesh line so they are more further away from each other. Uh, but it will never really work out because uh, I can move them apart like this. But they will never be the correct distance. Like if we, if we try to get this right, doesn't work, then all these don't bunch up. So yeah, instead of using the offset over here, uh, we're going to just leave it as is and reset all of the positions using a set position node. 
And of course, the set position node has two inputs you can work. You can either work with the offset, which just moves the object. It adds this vector to its original position vector, or you can rewrite all of the positions entirely. And that's what we're going to do. And we want to do it with the help of this node group we just created. Let's actually name it bounding boxes. So how do we do it? Well, uh, let's say this is a house and then this is a house. Now our bounding boxes node has created lovely bounding boxes across all of the houses. So it's all just boxes. So what we want to compare is the width of one box uh, with the width of the second box. Remember the origin is in the middle of both of these objects. Uh, and if we take these two vectors, uh, add them together so we get a longer vector, uh, then take half of that. So let's take half of that vector. And then this vector, the resulting vector will be the correct distance uh, between these two origin points. So that's a lot of information. Let's actually do it in nodes. First, let's get the size of our boxes and accumulate it using the accumulate field node. Now to make sure we're actually picking the right vector for the right instance, uh, we can use this instance index again and use that for our instance on points node and use that for our instance on points node. This way the output of these vectors will be in the same order as the instances that are picked out of the collection by the instance on points node. So let's get the size from our bounding boxes node that we've just created uh, and let's accumulate that value and we're going to set it to instance. And this is how we can compare the previous vector to the next vector. So let's add them together, like we said, uh, and let's scale them by 0.5, which is the same as dividing them by two. And then I wanna just multiply by one axis. So in this case, I'm gonna multiply by the X axis uh, so that our array will be on the X axis as well. Now, if we just connect this vector to our position input, we will see the magic that just happened. You'll see that the distance between buildings is perfect no matter which combination we use, which buildings we use. And we can connect another group input to our C down here to actually change it uh, so we can get different uh, buildings. Now to actually get them on the same level and also have them uh, basically be flat in this direction, uh, we can simply use the input selection on the offset. And let's again use our bounding box. Uh, let's get a vector multiply node. I'm gonna multiply the minimum by minus one on the Z and Y axes. It's gonna draw a vector from the origin to this point, I guess. And then we multiply it by minus one. So it becomes this vector and then we offset it by that amount. So if we connect it up, uh, you will see that they are now perfectly flat and also flat in this direction. Of course, it's also counting the stairs, for instance. So that's why these buildings are more far back. But in general, it works pretty well. And we can now move this down here, for instance. And we're not limited by just one axis. We can also pick the Y axis, but like that, uh, to put them behind each other. And even the Z axis, but that doesn't work right now because I've changed some of the roofs later on. So for instance, this roof I changed and now the origin is no longer exactly in the middle. Uh, so that's why that doesn't work right now. It's very important that your origin is in the middle of the object for all objects. So there we go. We've made our own version of the array modifier in Blender and upgraded it so it's even better than the modifier. Now, if you really want to give your geometry node skills a boost, I can highly recommend the sponsor of today's video, which is Brilliant. Now, the reason I'd recommend Brilliant.org to specifically geometry nodes users is because a lot of topics you'll see in geometry nodes are featured in Brilliant's courses. For instance, vector math. Brilliant has multiple courses related to vector math, like this beginner course. And through the thousands of interactive lessons, you will build an understanding of these kinds of topics. Aside from Vector Math, Brilliant offers lessons about regular math, physics, neural networks, AI, and much more. I myself am a big believer of learning by doing, and that's exactly what you do inside the courses of Brilliant because they are all interactive. If you want to try everything Brilliant has to offer, you can use my link brilliant.org slash creations to try out everything for 30 days. And the first 200 of you to sign up using the link will get 20% off an annual subscription. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Uh, I will be back with more videos in the future. I'm working on a lot of cool projects and I'm very excited to share everything with you. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned, subscribe for more. Leave a like if you enjoyed this video and I'll see you later. Bye bye.